Hey, before we get to the show, I have a quick message. I've been making opinion science for about two and a half years or so, and it's been amazing to meet so many new people, see this podcast grow, and I'm looking forward to even more of that in the coming year. I've also always tried to make this as good a podcast as it can be, even as a one-person operation. But making a good, regular podcast isn't free. Things like hosting the episodes online, licensing music, recording quality interviews, getting episodes transcribed to enhance accessibility, those have a price tag. One that I've covered out of pocket this whole time to spare you from cheap ads and other unsavory ploys. But I've decided to invite folks to contribute to the opinion science effort. No pressure. And honestly, I kind of hate this whole pledge drive vibe I've got going. And my plan is that the show will always be free. It's just that if you are so inclined to throw a few bucks at the podcast to help cover some of the operating costs and maybe even allow me to pursue some additional features, you can go to opinionsciencepodcast.com slash donate. And hey, open call to anyone with an organization that might be interested in sponsoring the show for a bit. Get in touch with me and I'm happy to chat. Um, okay, I I'm uncomfortable talking about money, so <laughs> so let's wrap this up and get to the show. There's this fun website out there called IUsedToBelieve.com. It's a place where people submit the weird things they used to believe when they were kids. And here are a few that they list as especially common false childhood beliefs. I used to think all music on the radio was performed live by the band in the studio. I used to believe that trees were what make the wind blow. I used to think the dangers of drinking and driving applied to all drinks, like water and juice. I used to believe that Anan was a real person's name. Actually, I believed this too. <laughs> in middle school, I was really into websites with inspirational quotes, and eventually I was like, who is this Anan guy? He has a lot of smart things to say. I used to believe that getting fired meant being set on fire. I used to believe that if you swallowed a seed, a plant would grow inside you. And on and on and on and on. They're all silly, obviously, but they're actual beliefs that eventually we grow out of as we learn more about the world. But that can be true of any belief, not just the silly ones we jump on as kids. When I was in college, I remember there was this popular NPR series turned book called This I Believe. And it was a set of essays about important people's core beliefs. At the time, I was a huge fan of the radio show This American Life, and they ran an episode called This I Used to Believe, a play on the popular book, and a show about people who let go of some core belief and what happened. And I don't know what it was, just the concept of that program has always had an impact on me. Like, it reminds me, we can believe things and feel like they are the right way to live our lives. We'll even write an essay about that belief for a best-selling book. But we can also abandon our beliefs. We can be wrong. And that's a good thing to keep in mind. You're listening to Opinion Science, the show about our opinions, where they come from, and how they change. I'm Andy Luttrell, and today I'm excited to share my conversation with Tennille Porter. Tennille is actually a new colleague of mine at Ball State University, where I work. She's an assistant professor of educational psychology. We met a few months ago, and she was just a fun person to talk ideas with, so I thought she would be great for the podcast. One of the things she studies is intellectual humility. We'll talk plenty about what that actually means, but essentially, it's the awareness that the things you believe might be wrong. Like how maybe swallowing seeds doesn't actually mean a plant will grow in your stomach. But also bigger things, like maybe my worldview, my opinions, my values, my belief in some conspiracy theory, maybe those are wrong too. And I don't actually have all the answers. This is a super fun one. It's another in a string of in-person recordings I've been able to do lately. So the vibe is a little bit more conversational and relaxed, and we take some twists and turns just exploring ideas and what they mean. So uh, d don't let me stop you. Let's jump right into my conversation with Tennille Porter. Mm -hmm. 
So I, I figured that the obvious place to start is also maybe something that throws us on shaky ground from minute zero, which is just the question of what is intellectual humility. So like if you were to just offer a general definition and then throw the necessary caveats <laughs> on top of it, how, how do you define this thing? Intellectual humility is recognizing the limitations of what you know and appreciating other people's intellect. Now, if you asked five researchers to define intellectual humility, you will get 20 different answers. So um, there's a lot of debate about how best to define it. Uh, but Mark Leary's kind of catchphrase is to say intellectual humility is recognizing that your beliefs might be wrong. Mm. Um, I like to think of intellectual humility as recognizing that what you know about the world is partial, that you only see one piece of an entire reality, and therefore you're going to get things wrong sometimes, mm -hmm. and they're going to have the, there are going to be lots of blind spots that you have or places where your knowledge is incomplete. Um, would you say that that is agreed upon or would you say for you, that's yeah. sort of how you've arrived at like, for me, this is, feels right to call it this or, or is that consensus? The most agreed upon part of intellectual humility is the piece about recognizing that our intellect, intelligence, knowledge is incomplete and is fallible. Um, people begin to disagree when you talk about whether to be intellectually humble, you need to respect other people's ideas. Some people say, no, intellectual humility is only about how you think about your own knowledge. Um, people disagree about whether intellectual humility should include behavioral parts. So can you be intellectually humble if you, you know, know that you might be wrong or know that you don't know something, but then hide that from the rest of the world and never mm. admit it publicly mm. or never show it in your behavior. So um, philosophers who study virtues would say, absolutely not. The virtue needs to come with a host of components, including what's going on in your head and also what your actions are and also why you're doing what you're doing, um, your motivations. But uh, psychologists, um, you know, don't always like to include uh, – the constructs can get messy if we include lots of things in them. Um, in our recent systematic review of all of the definitions and measures of intellectual humility, what really came through as the core was this part about – this cognitive part about knowing your knowledge is incomplete and recognizing that your beliefs are therefore fallible. Hmm. So in looking at the tables in this review, it's just so striking the variety of ways <laughs> in which people have come to this. Uh, and what's all, what was also weird to me is that it, it's not like, oh, over the last 60 years, there's been a slow evolution in how we think of this. And so we've added and subtracted from our definitions over time. It's really like in the last five to seven years, <laughs> there's just this explosion and a bunch of people simultaneously coming up with different ways of thinking about what intellectual humility is. So wh wh like, why did that happen? <laughs> like, what is it about intellectual humility that makes it so rife for being interpreted in so many different ways by so many different people in a short span of time? Mm. Yes. Why did that happen? Yes, you're right. The empirical research on intellectual humility, um, I don't think there's any before 2012. I mean, so somebody is going to call into your podcast yeah, yeah. and tell me that that's not right. And I'm ready for that. The phones are lighting that. up. <laughs> I'm ready for that. Um, but uh, the empirical research is very new. And part of the reason maybe that there have been so many different conceptualizations is that there's been a push towards interdisciplinary collaboration. And so... Philosophers have been working on concepts of virtue and intellectual virtues in particular for a bit longer than 
empirical researchers, psychologists. So as um, different psychologists teamed up with different teams of philosophers, I think that that made for some really interesting uh, dynamics that led us down this path of coming up with lots of different ideas about what this could be. But another just maybe less interesting but like <laughs> totally accurate explanation is that um, – you know, there have been a lot of big funding competitions f around this mm. construct of intellectual humility. So people have been applying at the same time to study intellectual humility, um, particularly uh, through grants from the John Templeton Foundation, as they're very interested in this concept. And so lots of things were being funded at the same time when there really wasn't much of a empirical mm. research base to start from. So everybody's been working on these foundational questions simultaneously. And um, I think just after this decade of doing that, we're at a point where we can kind of look back. So you'll mm. see I have those couple of reviews out there that mm. is taking stock of, okay, where mm. are we now? And um, yeah, I, yeah, anyway. <laughs> Maybe I'll stop there. I was going to like twist off in some other different direction. but Oh, I'm curious. I mean, the thing that worries me is that that happens and then you're stuck with this mess, right? And you go, you've done the legwork, but if people just ignore it, <laughs> they can very easily cite their past work and say, hey, this is how we've defined it before. And you get these things branching off in ever more dif distinct directions. Mm -hmm. Um and so what, what's the hope <laughs> for the future that we can actually get back to some core sense of yeah. what this means? Well, um, I'm not sure that the branching is a big problem because to me, I as long as people are being very clear about how they're defining and measuring intellectual humility, I think that will inform how we are synthesizing results mm -hmm. from this larger, broader literature. And I do think that in a – I think that the construct is rightfully potentially conceptualized in a really rich and nuanced and mm. multifaceted way. And so I'm a little bit reluctant to close the door on anything but this one conceptualization. Uh, I think it could potentially stifle progress. Mm. Um, so if we think about it as, you know – multifaceted and there are these different parts that we want to understand. I think that's still interesting. Mm. Think about empathy. Um, you could think about a feeling of empathy. You can think about empathic behavior. And each of those is really interesting to understand in its own right. So if I think about the future of intellectual humility, maybe these branches are each kind of studying one really interesting part of intellectual humility. And as a result, because we haven't just said, no, it has to be this and this thing alone. Um, we're getting this fuller picture of what it can do in society, of just how it its nature, like how it works. And anyway, but I'm curious like, about your thoughts on that, the branching and the problems of nobody can agree with it about what it is, mm -hmm. and that's a big problem. Like, What are your concerns about it? I think, so your point is very well taken, which is that uh, like we, we, if you were to try to just say on day one, Hey, everyone, this is what it is. You'd accidentally ignore all the different kinds of ways in which this thing could play out in the world. Mm -hmm. So I, I totally get that. The concern is that if everything, if everyone's calling their version, the same thing, mm -hmm. there's just this confusion yeah. where we sort of paint this picture of, we understand we've, everyone's calling it one word, <laughs> two <laughs> words. Uh, and that gives the illusion that all of these studies are about the same thing. Mm. And it takes someone to unpack it and go, wait a minute. Yeah. <laughs> Those studies really were focused on this. These ones were focused on this. And so, sure, it's multifaceted. But if no one of those studies is acknowledging that they're looking at one of several facets, mm -hmm. then th that paints maybe a misleading picture mm -hmm. of something that might be communicated as more unidimensional than it actually is. A fair point. <laughs> is the solution to just put it in the title, in the abstract? Like, this 
like expressed intellectual humility <laughs> or cognitive intellectual humility. You know, the language mm -hmm. gets a little bit cumbersome if you're having to use the term throughout an entire manuscript, but maybe signaling in a title and an abstract exactly what it's looking at could help. What do you mm -hmm. think about that as a as somebody on the <laughs> looking into this field still not great? <laughs> well, it's I, I mean, the trouble too is that it's it's not as clean as maybe I made it sound, which is that like, oh, there's version A, version B, and version C, mm -hmm. and people are only ever looking at one of those three versions. Looking at the, you know, table where you sort of say, here's, <laughs> here are the specific components that each of these different papers, like no one is only doing one at a time, mm -hmm. but they're doing different combinations of things. Yeah. And maybe conveying it as, oh, that we measured intellectual humility. Yeah. Um, and so it could help if it were a little more clear but i it, it almost just takes like a, okay we've we've made it this far let's all rally around <laughs> here are the whatever six dimensions of intellectual humility and now mm -hmm. we have a language for talking about like well which components are carrying which of these effects yeah. um cuz it's possible that you go well intellectual humility is associated with a b and c but actually it's a different piece of intellectual humility that predicted a that predicted b than predicted c and we again are now conflating three outcomes that are actually driven by quite different things. That's exactly right. And so I think if I do have a beef with the existing measures and conceptualizations is that many of them are meshing together a whole lot of different components and then don't have a great way of describing what those components are. You're seeing items in scales that are assessing how people feel about things, how people act in certain situations, what they think about their own beliefs and other people's beliefs, and it just becomes this kind of jumble of stuff in one long questionnaire, and I'm guilty of this too, um, creating a measure that isn't necessarily super clean. And so I think what I would hope is that, um, you know, yeah, that we could be a little bit more precise in our measurement and measure one piece at a time so that we can get those correlations between this facet of intellectual humility and whatever, uh, whatever we're interested in studying versus that feature to understand what's, what's driving this and also how do the components relate to one another. Um, because it's very interesting to think about who is the person who recognizes that they might be wrong but never shows that to the world or shows mm -hmm. us kind of overconfidence to the world or kind of shrinks back um, during conflicts or whatever, during mm -hmm. disagreements. Um, that's Those are really interesting questions to me, and that feels like stuff that should be worked out. Mm -hmm. Especially when, you know, if we're selling this idea out in the world, the public world, and we go mm – -hmm. Be more intellectually humble yeah. in order to accomplish, you know, these societal wonders. Yeah. <laughs> that again is misleading. If if I go well, actually, it turns out that there's actually one way you can be intellectually humble that does that. And if you've done the other three versions of intellectual humility, great job. Thanks for for trying. <laughs> but those aren't the things that actually had to happen mm -hmm. for us to accomplish this outcome. Yes. So from a public engagement standpoint, which I'm always kind of coming back to, yeah. That also seems potentially problematic because I do think I mean the the question of tolerance and disagreement and conflict like those are such important and pressing questions that it's really I mean we're we're jonesing for <laughs> some solution but if that solution is sort of too quickly supplied as a very generic thing that actually misses the mark of the the underlying piece that has to be there mm. then then maybe that's a problem too. Um, Agreed. But but I don't think we're going to solve this dilemma today. <laughs> I think that's probably true. Yeah, yeah, I think uh, that's probably true. But if we take <laughs> if we take that, at least there there's, does seem to be like some core. Like, yes. I, I don't think we're trying to say as strongly <laughs> that there are six fundamentally <laughs> un unrelated and independent things. But there is some core, it seems. Yes. Like, like you defined it as just kind of knowing the limits of your knowledge and intellect yeah. and knowing that you are fallible in the way that you think about things. That's right. Um why is that good? Is it good? <laughs> like, yeah. So uh, I, I, I uh, believe that this is a thing that people can think, mm. but what are the implications of approaching the world in that way? Mm. Great question. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, how many ways to answer this question? 
There, there are a lot. So, so let me. Yeah. Uh, uh, I'll I'll put the train down one track, which is <laughs> maybe what kind of captures my attention most. Like I was just talking about with disagreement. Yeah. Um, and so, if we live in a world, which we do, yes. <laughs> where people have different opinions about things, yeah. uh, and we grapple with what it means to differ in our opinion from someone else, what is it that intellectual humility might bring to the table in that kind of situation? What we see in the research is that when you are able to recognize that you might be wrong, you become a little bit more open to listening to views that don't currently align with your own, and therefore you open yourself up to learning something new. You know, the fact of the matter is that we are humans, and as human beings, we are fallible. That's just the fly in the ointment. Of being a human being. Like, we are, we're fallible creatures. We step into mistakes. And so um, there become kind of two options in light of that fallibility. <laughs> like, one is just pretend it doesn't exist and, like, plow through my life thinking, like, no, 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 I've got it. Everything's great. And the other is actually reckoning with the reality and acknowledging the truth and that's what intellectual humility is. It's saying, yeah, I, I am fallible. Okay, so how do I live my life in light of the fact that I am fallible? And I think that basically if I could boil down the essence of the benefit of intellectual humility across, you want to, uh, disagreements across a lot of different contexts is that intellectual humility makes it possible to grow. And without it, you can become stuck where you are. You're not willing to acknowledge that sometimes you, if you're not willing to acknowledge that you might be wrong, there would be no reason for you perhaps to hear out opinions that differ from your own. I'm not sure if that's true. <laughs> <laughs> but I think so, baby. And uh, yeah. Anyway, thoughts on that? Well, the fact that it is a reality that we're fallible raises a question that I had, which is I kind of, and this maybe uh, reveals my personal intellectual humility, <laughs> which is that I, I have such trouble understanding a less intellectually humble worldview. Uh, so do we know anything about what it means to look out at the world and say, Yes, I have it figured out. No, Nobody knows anything that I need to know. I have everything that I have. Is that plausible? Are, are there, I mean, it's sort of a weird question. Are there people who think this? Yeah, Clearly can we are. think of somebody <laughs> who, who kind of thinks in this way? Like, I am never wrong. Mm -hmm. I can never lose. I always win. Everything I say is correct. Um, what I believe is always correct, what I think is always correct, and the world needs to bend to my uh, ideas of reality and my <laughs> supposed knowledge. I mean, I think that we do. We can think of maybe some people, <laughs> maybe some sure, leaders in our sure. lives who are that way. And uh, I, In cases like that, I mean, I know exactly what you're talking about, but I, I still just have this little pang of like they don't really think that though like they obviously understand that <laughs> they don't have it all figured out i um, i do wonder about that is it real like is it real does is everybody intellectually humble is kind of yeah right it just seems like <laughs> isn't course. that a, the constraint of reality <laughs> yeah. is that i have to understand that i'm only one person with one set of eyes and one brain but I mean, clearly that's not that, – that can't be the case <laughs> based on the fact that we see variance and uh, all this – I mean, like it has to – there has to be variance in it. But I just – it's one of those things. It's kind of like a cultural thing where I go, yeah. I cannot actually put myself <laughs> in that other mindset in the way that I can with other sorts of personalities. I go, oh, I'm maybe a little more introverted, but I can – I mean, I, I think I understand what it means to be extroverted. <laughs> um and I see people have fun out in the world socially, and I go, yeah, 
you're having fun <laughs> mm-hmm. in a situation where, I don't know, I don't think I'd have fun, but like I get that this is a fun experience. <laughs> uh-huh. But yeah, th- this this is the part that I, I have some trouble with. So, so let me twist it a little bit, which is uh, it's a metacognition. Yes. Which is also the kind of thing you can't always do, right? So we like metacognitions require cognitions, right? We have to first be thinking and then be thinking about our thinking. Yes. And so it's a kind of a complicated sort of thing. Yes. And part of me earlier today, as I was thinking about this stuff, was wondering is maybe what this is capturing is sort of a commitment to overriding the default, where we go, everybody has these like confirmation biases and these heuristics. Mm-hmm. And when I'm tired, when uh, I have to make quick decisions, I operate as though I have all the information and I'm right. But intellectual intellectual humility is really tracking my willingness to put on my metacognition hat Mm -hmm. and say, hold on, (laughs) pump the brakes. And so it's less that, like, if you really probed, people generally might say, like, oh, yeah, no, I I, obviously I don't know everything. (laughs) Uh, But really what this is, is do I value the process of questioning those assumptions and not my belief in my infallibility. I don't know. Does that make any sense? It does make sense, especially the point on, is this just so obvious everybody must have this? Like, of course. No one's Mm -hmm. going to think that they know – no one's going to admit that they think they know everything. I think that people do, though, mm, begin to forget about the – a great expanse of their ignorance. Mm. And this is um, Dave Dunning's work mm-hmm. and others that um, when we get them into certain contexts, contexts where they have a degree of expertise or where they have really strong mm. feelings, things become a little bit differently. You see people thinking a little bit differently and all of a sudden this kind of, well... I don't know everything, but like that goes out the window. People just kind of lose awareness um, that they do only see a small piece. And I do think that that is a human thing that we Mm -hmm. do a lot. We forget. We forget our fallibility when we're kind of, yeah, I think that it happens. So, So, yes, I agree with you. I don't think anybody would say... I, I'm omniscient, but uh, maybe, maybe the individual difference, getting to your question about that, the true individual difference is about how often you're able to apply this metacognitive awareness across contexts, mm-hmm. how reliably you're able to do that, how appropriately you're able to do it. So it becomes about kind of frequency and calibration of that questioning to a given situation and being in the habit of doing it. And would you agree with me that people are going to differ in that habit? Yeah. So so what this is sort of making me confront is <laughs> I was a little too quick to look to the extremes of a continuum as evidence for the existence of a continuum. <laughs> and so... <laughs> Yeah, maybe it's very, very rare for someone to truly say, I absolutely have all the answers and no one has anything I don't know. But I could imagine that there's some degree of difference, relative difference in willingness to say, yeah, I I don't know everything, but I mean, come on, I've lived this life. I've seen a lot of things. I think I know a thing or two about a thing or two. Um, And that's not like absolute ignorance of your fallibility, but it's a willingness to say, ah, come on, like I, I, I think I... Give me some credit here. <laughs> I know something. Uh, so, so that's part of it. And the other thing is it, it sort of raises the distinction that I know has been made between domain general versus domain specific mm. intellectual humility. Yeah. So can you explain a little bit what that dif- distinction is? Sure. And this is pulling from some of Rick Hoyle's work and others um, where – The idea is that you can maybe be intellectually humble in general, so you think on a high level that your beliefs, regardless of the context, are fallible. You just have this awareness about the totality of your beliefs, (laughs) that they may be fallible. The domain-specific version says, okay, I can have varying degrees of awareness of my fallibility depending on the belief itself. So I can be very intellectually humble about 
vaccine safety and not very intellectually humble about my beliefs on gun control or vice versa. It's just saying that people are going to vary in how willing they are to admit or acknowledge the limitations of their beliefs depending on the belief itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Then, so, shall yeah, we so, try that again? Yeah, no, no, no that, that <laughs> makes sense to me. I mean, I, I just in, I, I'll sort of say what I have picked up as what in my reading of it. And yes. you can tell me if I've sort of <laughs> a little too uh, uh, open with my, with my interpretation, which is just, you know, like you can think of domains as just areas of expertise mm -hmm. and you go domain general just means like you said, in the world of the things that I know, mm -hmm. are there things that I know or don't know? Like <laughs> just in, in the world, like, do I think I'm the kind of person who's able to always have the right answer to things? Uh, maybe sometimes, yeah. Maybe sometimes, no. Like, I, you know. But in a certain situation, I mean, I go, you know, my job. I may feel as though I'm I know more about the human condition than I actually do, <laughs> because I've spent all these years reading papers about a thin sliver of <laughs> the human condition, and so I may actually be a little less intellectually humble about this world that I work in mm -hmm. when I probably ought to be a little more so, um, even though in general, I might consider myself quite intellectually humble. I go, yeah, but there are some things that I do think I have a leg up on the world <laughs> mm -hmm. about. Uh, and I'm, I'm less willing to trust, you know, these lay theories of psychology because <laughs> what do they know about the life they live? <laughs> yeah, I really like that. And I think what you're saying raises a question that has yet to be explored. So for future intellectual mm -hmm. humility researchers out there listening, um, when is it appropriate to have less intellectual humility? I mean, is it appropriate to have less intellectual humility about the safety and viability of the COVID vaccines? What's the, you know, that's an interesting question because we have real data that speaks to the safety of these vaccines that can be brought to bear. And so especially I think when we get into talking about domain-specific intellectual humility – and we're thinking about this as a virtue, which means it needs to be appropriately calibrated to the situation and the evidence at hand. Um, you know, we can hold open the possibility that having really high specific intellectual humility about all beliefs may not be virtuous mm -hmm. and may not be a good thing. Mm -hmm. And teasing apart what are the contexts or what are the conditions that make specific intellectual humility, virtuous versus not, ha is work that still needs to be done. It, it's sort of, I've been reading a lot about um, climate change denial campaigns and the sort of rhetoric that's been used therein. Right. And a lot of this like presenting, you know, going back to tobacco lobbyists and tobacco companies many years ago, where they go, our only job is to keep the debate alive, to constantly cast doubts and go, hey, we haven't actually proven this yet. And in fact, many of those same folks who are in these tobacco campaigns ended up being heavy hitters in, you know, questioning global warming and acid rain and all these sorts of things. And the through line is this idea of they desperately want to present issues as unresolved, mm. right? which it kind of feels like the intellectual humility approach to go, mm -hmm. ah, we'll never, ever truly know the right That's answer. Right. But you go, well, maybe at a certain point, we ought to close the book <laughs> on some of these things and go, uh, ought we present this as such an open debate? Or is that actually misleading, right? And we kind of, to your point, maybe say, this is a case where we're not completely shutting the door. Like, hey, we could still be wrong, but maybe we'll move on to other domains where we can explore the questions <laughs> openly in that way. Absolutely. Absolutely right. Yeah, that is <laughs> what I'm thinking. I... um. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah. I'm working with a philosopher, Oded Zippori, to try to uh, kind of come up with these criteria. I mean, we see these claims to humility sometimes, to intellectual humility. You think about the election denial is one of them, the nicotine mm -hmm. <laughs> trials being another, very intentionally sowing doubt. But, um, you know, one thing I think that characterizes election denialism is that 
folks on denying the the election results aren't willing to question the fallibility of their own denial. And so that becomes a kind of interesting thing to play with as we as a public are having to (laughs) sort through a mess of so much information and, you know, trying to make sense of it all, needing to make sense of it all. It's like thinking about intellectual humility for me, but not for thee, or (laughs) the other Mm. way around, (laughs) intellectual Mm -hmm. humility for thee, but not for me. And I think that's just a big red flag Mm. showing us that that's not authentic, virtuous intellectual humility. When you're asking other people to have it, when you're saying, no, no, we'll never know, but you seem to have already come to the conclusion yourself with some degree of like extreme certainty, Mm. that seems disingenuous to me. And I guess the other part I wanted to this that what you said made me think of is that I think it is important to uh, to maybe always hold open that centimeter of a chance that we could overturn what we already know because we do make new discoveries and part of intellectual humility is being open to overturn knowledge. There was a time when we thought that the earth was flat. There was a time when that was the prevailing science of the day at a time when we thought that all of the planets revolved around the earth. I mean, there are moments when we take great leaps forward and have to paradigm shift and disregard what we thought was true. Intellectual humility allows us to do that. Um, But we have to be very careful about it because I don't think that it's virtuous or helpful to be living in extreme doubt about matters on which our current gold standard evidence is suggesting that this is the current answer. Can you can you pinpoint what about this is interesting to you? <laughs> like like what brought you to 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 this topic? Yeah. Thanks for that question. Um I think that the topic is really fascinating. So I was a grad student way back, way back in the day. I was a grad student and I had these experiences in my classes feeling like, especially early, you know, in the first couple years of grad school, where there was so much negotiation around knowledge in classrooms. People were trying it felt like people were trying to seem like they knew a lot. Mm. I didn't feel like I knew very much, but everybody else seemed to think like they knew a lot. And um, I just became kind of fascinated with the social role that our own (laughs) knowledge and like Mm. showing doubt or showing ignorance to others, how that plays out. In all kinds of situations, I guess I was also kind of noticing differences in professors. So I had professors who would be pretty closed to questioning of their ideas and pretty dismissive of critiques. Um, And maybe that dismissiveness was warranted in a sense. I can't remember specifics. But I had other kinds of professors who weren't dismissive and who were open to questioning and um, seeing those two orientations of people in this context where we're all supposed to be about learning and new discovery was just interesting to me. I just noted it. So it's very fascinating. Um, I think that it's such a puzzle to figure out, yeah, what's the appropriate level of intellectual humility um, for the given situation? What can this do for us? When does this become maladaptive? When is it adaptive? It gets down to kind of, yeah. I'll stop. <laughs> I'm just <laughs> rambling. No, that was great. And I, I mean, I, I wanted to also talk about the work that you do, like actually in education, sure, uh, which incorporates intellectual humility as well, but in, in kind of a different flavor it seems to me maybe you don't see them as distinct but to me there's like the, a version of this that's kind of a very like highfalutin the philosophers debating in the marketplace of ideas and then a version of that that's kids navigating 
an education system uh, that is asking them to know things. Um, and so what is it about intellectual humility that matters to students in school? Yeah. So what <laughs> intellectual humility helps students in school learn and grow just the same as it helps us adults learn and grow through disagreements. Um, one concern that I had about humility was whether intellectually humble students might become really helpless as soon as they encountered a challenge or setback. Maybe they are so humble, they recognize they are fallible, and so um, when challenges come at them, they just sort of throw up their hands, and it's just kind of like, well, this is the way it is. I'm never going to know. I'm kind of helpless here, and that's just what it's going to be. I was concerned about that. The opposite to the helplessness pattern is a mastery pattern where students encounter a challenge and are like, okay, maybe this feels uncomfortable, but also I'm really interested in getting to the bottom of this and trying to understand it better. And so with some colleagues, we did studies to see, well, which is it? Is intellectual humility leading to this kind of helplessness or is it associated with mastery? And we found that the more intellectually humble the students were, the more they seemed to care about getting it right. So when they would be confronted with their fallibility, their mistakes, the more effortful and persistent they became in overcoming those mistakes and kind of getting it right, <laughs> striving to learn because they wanted to be accurate mm. and they were willing to acknowledge that something wasn't quite right. They were more open to feedback from their teachers or their professors coming to them saying, you know, this needs some work. Okay. All right. I could see that. Let me, can you work with me to improve it? We, so there are studies out about that and, um, Ultimately, there's some evidence that intellectually humbler students earn higher grades. Um, I think that, you know, finding probably depends a lot on how you measure intellectual humility and what parts of it you're measuring. I'm not sure that those items that are just asking about, you know, political beliefs or something like that are going to be super associated one way or the other with your grades in school. However, being aware of generally your fallibility, being willing to express that as part of intellectual humility, it does help. Hmm. So the this the kind of two competing <laughs> yeah. possibilities yeah. Uh, also kind of remind me of uh, another aspect. I forget what I was going to tie it back to, but the question of is, does intellectual hu humility require something of your belief that there is a right answer, right? Because, like, there's a version of it, like you're saying, where you go, there's there's no right answer. Like, mm -hmm. that's what intellectual humility is, is realizing I am fallible, I don't know everything, therefore I'll never know the right answer mm -hmm. to these questions. Versus, like, a very subtly different version mm -hmm. where you go, no, I do think there is a right answer, and the only way to get there <laughs> is to be open to the fact that I might not have gotten it right yet, um, which is kind of like what, what we were saying about how calibrated are you? Are there cases where you go, th that that question only makes sense if people go, oh, no, there are some, like, if there's a right answer, I, I might have it, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I might actually be on the right side. And so it, it might actually be maladaptive for me to keep my mind open about this because I figured it out. Uh -huh. And so, yeah, I, I guess I don't know what, what folks have talked about in this world of does it require that people think that there's a right answer? Is that part and parcel of intellectual humility? Or is that like this independent dimension that changes the course of what humility does for people? Ooh, super interesting, Andy. <laughs> That's super interesting. Um, yeah. People talk about intellectual humility in terms of truth. People talk about – philosophers talk about how intellectually humble people love the truth. Mm. And so the truth connotes this idea that there is rightness, <laughs> that there is a truth. That's right. Um, I think that when we talk about right and wrong answers, it's probably more helpful to talk about the spectrum of like it can be righter or wronger. And we're always trying to move a little bit closer to 
what's right. But maybe at the end of that tunnel, I guess is what I'm arguing, is that there is a kind of platonic ideal. Like there is truth out there somewhere and intellectual humility is supposed to be moving us closer to that. And that's what intellectually humble people care about most is getting closer to that. And that's why um, they are willing to change their beliefs about things when evidence suggests that they ought to because they care about being accurate <laughs> and about getting closer to this truth. So um, – and I feel like that's something that can help us in society today if we um, – value that I mean do you believe that there's a truth mm -hmm. but uh, if we value the truth the can kind of thinking of our political disputes mm. that it I don't know yeah there might be different domains where truth is more or less relevant right like there are beliefs about the world yeah. <laughs> where there's something is right or it's wrong yeah. and then your classic preference or attitudes right like Agreed. do i need to <laughs> believe there's a true best flavor of ice cream no i think we're, i think we'll be all right <laughs> yeah. if we accept that like there's not one right answer to that yeah. but you know uh is our climate changing? It either is or it isn't. Uh, and there is a right answer to that question. Um, yeah, the, the the danger of, it seems, interpreting intellectual humility as just pure openness mm -hmm. just means there's no, like, there's no uh, goal, right? There's no, you're not moving, you're just sort of flopping around. Yeah. <laughs> and then you go, ah, I explored ideas and yeah. maybe that's enough. But, uh yeah, it does seem like that's an assumption that that matters for how you interpret. I agree. What this does for you. I agree. I really like that. And and in schools, the thing is, it's possible that if a school system is really built as they often are, mm -hmm. to be like there are right answers to test questions, <laughs> uh, right? That sets the rules of the game differently than in some of these other domains that we're talking about. And so maybe that's a case where yeah, intellectual humility is good because you go okay. <laughs> there is going to be a right answer, right? There's the there's an answer that's going to win me the points. Uh, that's the right one. Uh, and so having this mindset helps me get there. Mm -hmm. um, and so if that's the case, are there ways that we can encourage kids to adopt that mindset more? Yeah. My new favorite method for increasing development of intellectual humility is modeling it ourselves. Mm. And this is hard. <laughs> this is hard. <laughs> um, it's not always easy to uh, express it when you have gotten something wrong. It's not always easy to reveal that to your kids. If you are perhaps a parent or a teacher out there and uh, – you're trying to teach your kids something. It's not always easy to admit, I don't know everything there is to know about mm. what I'm trying to teach you. Mm. I mean, I figured it out and come along this far, and I know a lot about it, and that's just the truth. I know a lot about it. I actually know more than you do. Uh, but I don't know everything there is to know. That can feel hard. But what we're learning in our research is that it's really powerful when teachers – are able to do that, and those are the only studies that we have on teachers or professors. But I imagine we'd see similar pattern with parents and maybe even across other domains. If you think about if your doctor showed some mm. humility um, or your nurse. So we're finding that when folks are able to model humility for young people, it licenses a kind of vulnerability. It just says, this is a space where your own vulnerability is going to be welcomed and accepted. And students, therefore, and children become more comfortable expressing intellectual humility themselves. Um, well, uh, can you say what it looks like to to show <laughs> intellectual – like, yeah. what if I am to try to do this, right, and model for my kid <laughs> – this way of approaching the world, yeah. right? I may personally have these values, mm -hmm. but what what will I want to make sure I'm expressing 
overtly in a way that someone could pick up? I think that you want to express that even areas where you know a lot, you don't know everything there is to know, and there's a chance that you could learn something new. I think you'd want to express that there are many different ways to approach a problem, usually, that your way may not be the only way, and you're capable of learning, even from your child, about how to solve a particular problem. Um, and I think you'd want to communicate that mistakes are really special and valuable opportunities for learning. Mistakes can feel so painful. They feel sometimes like, I don't know, <laughs> not something that can enhance our growth. And I think we as parents and teachers, we may often want to protect the kids that we care about so much from feeling the pain that comes with mistakes. And sometimes in that urge to protect them, we deny that a mistake has even happened. But what humility can offer us, I think, is this chance to say, you know what, I did make a mistake. And look, it's that's great. I'm going to remember that for a really long time. I just learned something really important. I'm going to take that with me. It's great. It's wonderful. It's part of being alive. So those those things, I would say. My, my to toddler's favorite words are, uh-oh. So <laughs> I think we're okay. <laughs> it's constantly, even when Steph is like, hey, I don't, I don't really see what went wrong here. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> I go, oh, okay, well, maybe let's, whatever you think you did, uh, if you think it's wrong, we'll not do it next time. So, but I am curious how – how different is this from growth mindset? Because mm. kind of what you described sounded to me like how you would describe modeling a growth mindset. Is that is that yeah. different or are we saying, oh, these are two areas that have kind of come upon the same insight? Right. Um, I think that there is some overlap in how you model a growth mindset and how you model intellectual humility. Um, a growth mindset – you know, the targets are different, though. Mm. A growth mindset is about developing a belief that our abilities are malleable and that they can be developed. And intellectual humility is about developing a belief that, you know, we're human and we don't have all of the answers. What we see in the research is this connection between growth mindset and intellectual humility that the more you have a growth mindset, the easier it is for you to also have intellectual humility because your fallibility isn't a kind of final word on your competence. You, you can always grow and improve. So they're definitely – these concepts are related for sure. I also see them as distinct, but there is going to be some overlap in how to model them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so what's next on the agenda <laughs> for you? What, what, are, what are the new questions that, that you and uh, folks that you're working with are starting to chip away at? Oh, um, I mean, one area of questions that fascinates me is in thinking about intellectual humility and justice. So what do we make of intellectual humility when we bring power into the equation mm -hmm. and think about issues of social justice? You know, is it incumbent upon a group that has been pushed to the margins of society to be intellectually humble about certain beliefs? Is it as incumbent upon that individual as it is upon an individual who has a lot of power in a certain situation? So this is a fascinating question. and. Um, I'm part of a working group now that's going to be reading about this and talking about it and trying to understand it more. But some work that I have in the pipeline right now, just in development, is trying to understand, you know, what are the experiences of diverse students when it comes to expressing intellectual humility? Like actually speaking up and saying, well, I don't know what that is, or, or I, that's confusing to me, or, oh, I got that one wrong. What is that like for diverse students? And what we're seeing is that there are more barriers to doing that for students 
who face a sort of stigma because of their identity, whose competence is called into question because of mm. um, because of who they are and because of their identity. So you think of a woman in a computer science class, you know, the stereotype is that women aren't great in computer science. So you, a woman in a computer science class, has to think really hard about whether she's going to raise her hand and ask, voice her question, uh, because people are already kind of perhaps doubting whether she can take it in this class. So that's coming through loud and clear and in uh, some of the work that we're doing now in interviews with a bunch of different college students. Um, so that's part, I think, part of that piece of understanding intellectual humility and power and justice and how all of those things come together. Nice. Well, I will be excited to see what, what comes of that. Hey, thank you. It, it's getting late, so uh, right. I'm going to go ahead yes, and call it, it here. Uh, okay, but thanks for good. taking the time to, to talk about all this. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. All righty, that'll do it for another episode of Opinion Science. Thank you so much to Tennille for coming by to talk with me about her work. You can find more at TennillePorter.com or just check the webpage for this episode for a link to her site and to the papers that come up in our conversation. You can find all episodes of Opinion Science, including transcripts, links to relevant resources, and more at OpinionSciencePodcast.com. Subscribe for new episodes the second they come out. And, you know, it, it, it's, it's about to be holiday time, so use that generous spirit to leave a nice review of the show online, somewhere like Apple Podcasts, to show the world that we're worth checking out. And one more quick reminder that I've opened up listener contributions to help the show. Pitch in a few bucks to cover the boring details like web hosting, recording fees, and transcription. You can find a simple PayPal link at opinionsciencepodcast.com slash donate. And like, I'm not an official nonprofit, so you cannot write this off on your taxes. So sorry about that. Okay, doke. One more episode for 2022 coming in a couple weeks. I'll see you then. Bye-bye.